Sunday night, uh, September 14th, I um, was, late afternoon, let's say, I was uh, in our backyard swimming pool at my house in Newport Beach, California. At the time, um, I had a one-year-old daughter and I had a uh, uh, about three-and-a-half-year-old son, and, and I was playing with them, and my, I, I had a BlackBerry uh, that was company-issued. I was uh, managing director at Morgan Stanley at the time. And I had a, uh, like a probably a 1.0, maybe by then it was a 2.0, I can't remember, of the iPhone. And between the text and the and the uh, CNBC alerts and everything that was going off, it, it was just, you know, buzzing and beeping and vibrating like crazy. And um, I had an office up in, in the third floor of our house that was like a, my home office. Back then, I didn't really work in it very much, actually. I, I work in my library at our new house now all the time but but um if i was upstairs at that house working it was usually because something really bad was going on and anyways i go upstairs i have cnbc on and and um uh what we now know had been an entire weekend of effort for the wall street uh uh ceos to get together uh along with the uh federal reserve key leadership and the treasury department and they were there to kind of solve the issue of the um, of of uh, Lehman Brothers, the solvency of Lehman Brothers. Uh, that that the all the Wall Street banks agreed if there wasn't some sort of contained arrangement that there'd be a spillover to all of their financial health as well, and uh, it behooved them to try to figure something out. The best play was to have either uh, have a buyer. Bank of America was the most likely U.S.-based buyer. Some point over the weekend, they walked away from the deal. And and uh, Barclays, a large British uh, bank, was a very serious contender to come in, buy the assets on the cheap, was the idea. But they ended up on Sunday not being able to get their regulator regulator approval. And, and all of the different Wall Street firms that may have had some capacity to come help were demanding some federal backstop either Treasury or Fed kind of insurance behind any transaction, and none of that backstop was forthcoming. And so it left Lehman Brothers with no choice but to declare bankruptcy. And for the rest of history, I'm very confident we're going to associate the fall of Lehman with the financial crisis, because as we're going to see in the next you know handful of, of comments, you, you, there was a chain reaction of events that all followed the Lehman event. And it does give a certain degree of a feeling that Lehman's fall was the cause of these subsequent events. That's not necessarily true, even though it's kind of understandable that one would perceive it that way. But let me, let me put it this way. Lehman was insolvent because they were over levered in a way that nobody else was. Roughly 40 to 1 leverage. It took a 2.5% drop in assets to essentially render the firm insolvent. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's the kind of ABC math of it, okay? Um, they, after the uh, collapse of Bear Stearns in March, had been told over and over and over again and given over and over opportunity, given opportunities over and over again in the marketplace to raise equity to go raise capital by selling equity. Uh, it would be dilutive, but they would raise money that did not carry a debt burden on their balance sheet and would help to save the firm. And they did not do so, and to the extent they did a little around the edges, it was nowhere near adequate. So they had a $20, $40, 60000000000 billion hole in their balance sheet, and they were trying to fill it with $4.5 billion from the you know, Kuwaitis and, and little deals like that. There was a talk of them doing a big sale to the Koreans, and that deal fell through the week of. And the stock, I think, closed at about 7 bucks on the Friday, uh, September 12th. And I can remember so many colleagues and folks on their keyboard right up to the market close Friday trying to buy Lehman, believing some deal would happen over the weekend. And they'd come in Monday morning and have had that free, free ride of, uh, uh, of appreciation. And I can say on the record, I did not do that neither for client money or for my own money. Um, not because I saw what was going to happen, but nobody was in my camp was in any mood to take those kind of risks at that point. Well, and there was no deal forthcoming, and Lehman woke up at effectively zero on, on Monday morning, as we now know, and it triggered a 500-point sell-off in the Dow, 
And this was back when 500 divided by a Dow around 10,000 was a pretty big deal. And so you, you really do have a um, memorable catalyst around the fall of Lehman. Now, let's say it hadn't been Lehman, or let's say the government had bailed them out. Then was Citi going to be okay? No. Citi's balance sheet was, was beaten to pieces. Wachovia's balance sheet uh, was beaten up. We're going to see in, a, in a, another segment what happened to AIG. But the fall of Lehman um, is indeed the iconic moment uh, because it came first. And their stubbornness uh, out of the C-suite to, to not raise equity capital when they had the opportunity is a decision that will rest in infamy. Um, but fundamentally, the coming to Jesus of Wall Street's excessive leverage had begun. And on Sunday night, September 14th, as I sat late into night working on my computer, watching the news reports, reading up on the impact to other stocks, other futures markets, other overnight global equity markets, it was very clear that, um, that things were never going to be the same.